All right, and we're back with another episode of Black Life Amplified. It's the virtual town hall series hosted by the African American Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany L. Wright with Insight News. And before we get started, I want to give a very special thank you to our sponsors who help make this town hall possible. That includes the Minneapolis Foundation, North Point Health and Wellness, and Children's Minnesota. And of course, I want to give a very special thank you to our partners and producers who really make this town hall possible every single week. Uh, those participants include North Point Health and Wellness, Children's Minnesota, Insight News, Gray Matter, uh, Minnesota Community Care, and uh, thank you team for all that you do. Um, it's really been amazing to work with you all. Uh, I want you to go ahead, if you're watching, to make sure that you stick around to the African American Leadership Forum Facebook page, as well as the YouTube channel to watch previous episodes of Black Life Amplified, and be sure that you like, comment, and subscribe uh, in the event that we have future episodes coming out. Uh, last week's episode was focused on centering Black men's health. It was actually a two-part conversation that was phenomenal, and we really got to center the Black men in our community to lift them up and to hear their perspectives on their approach to health and wellness. And I definitely learned a lot and I think you will too. So I hope you check out that conversation. But on today, we are focused on making history within the city of Minneapolis. We are recapping uh, last night's election and we're talking about where do we go from here? What does this mean for the state of Minnesota, um, for the city of Minneapolis specifically, for the future of public safety? And then we're going to kind of zoom out and take a look at what does this mean for us as a community nationwide? So joining me on today's panel, of course, I have Adrian Thornton, who is the Manager of Experience and Health Equity at Children's Minnesota. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you for being here. I have Brett Buckner, who is the Managing Director for One Minnesota. I have Angela Rose Myers, who is the President for the Minneapolis Chapter of the NAACP. Uh, and I have a longtime friend of the show, Ron Harris, who is a political strategist. So welcome back, Ron. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. We're, of course, going to jump into all things election and politics in just a little bit. But of course, we do have to check in with our health and wellness. That is the foundation of the show and what brings us all together. Uh, so I want to uh, just kick off this question. Where do you all think that we're at as a community as it relates to, relates to getting vaccinated? You know, we, we did our panel last week talking about censoring Black men's health. And all of our panelists, uh, young Black men who work in the health industry in one way or another, None of them were vaccinated. So I'm curious for you all, do you think that we are hitting a wall as a community? Um, or is there something that can be done to really change the minds and hearts of our loving cousins who just haven't bought into the vaccine yet? Ron, what do you think? Well, everybody, Ron Harris here. Britt, so glad to be back on the panel. Thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, I think we have to talk differently about the vaccine, right? We keep talking about how accessible it is, but I think that we're missing the difference between accessibility and availability. So the vaccines are available right now, but they might not be that accessible. And we're starting to see along, and I'm not a, a public health expert, but we're starting to see the similar trends of access to health resources and vaccine uh, adoption and usage, pretty much the same. So it's a much larger conversation systemically around um, how we talk about vaccines, how people adopt them. We need to have more folks in community as trusted messengers, right? The, the PR campaigns and having celebrities and elected officials talk about it doesn't work, right? But the person you see every day at the grocery store or at the coffee shop or the people that watch your kids or some of your colleagues at work, that actually might be a much better venue and opportunity to actually communicate around um, vaccine adoption and usage. And so um, we're getting there, right? We're getting there and folks are starting to trust uh, and see their own family members with those vaccines um, and even in my family, right? My grandparents weren't down with the vaccine at all. Uh, they were like, God got me, I'm not worried about all that. But after all of us got ours and you know, over the course of a couple of months and realized we didn't get an extra arm or get super sick as it relates to the vaccine, they started adopting them as well. And so I think that we just have to continue to model what it looks like to um, keep ourselves safe and keep our families safe. And we're smart folks, we're gonna get there. We absolutely will. And you bring up a really phenomenal point that I think a lot of our family members and community members are navigating is sometimes people feel like it is a violation of their faith. Uh, 
to move forward with the vaccine because I trust in God, right? So why why would I allow these external things and and man to determine the fate fate of my health when I know that God has me? And um, for me, my my grandparents are both ministers and they're vaccinated, you know. And we made a decision as a family that we were all going to get vaccinated. Now, of course, there are some cousins um, who have not gotten on the train yet, and they've actually got COVID as a result. Um, but I I I do think that sometimes um, our our traditions uh, keep us from moving forward and allowing us to really accept the resources that are available as it relates to health vaccines being one of them. Uh, so I think I just want to encourage folks out there, you know, you can you can love God and get vaccinated at the same time. And that's totally, totally OK. Uh, Angela Rose, I want to pivot to you. You've been doing a lot of work with the Minneapolis uh, NAACP as it relates to COVID. What do you think are the biggest bar barriers that are preventing our community from getting vaccinated at a higher rate? Yes, no, I definitely agree with uh, Ron Harris's uh, analysis. And I'll also say for uh, you, Brittany, even talking about this idea that God got me, why don't we see this as a gift from God, right? Why don't we see the tools and the things that God has provided for us, particularly since it was a Black woman doctor who pioneered on the vaccine, um, and the special technology that the, va the vaccine utilizes. Like, why couldn't this be in the phrasing and phraseology a gift from God in that sense, right? Um, I mean, if we wanted to live by the Bible, we know, you know, we, I'm not going back to the donkey and cart days, okay? Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to drive to, to work in my car and I'm happy to have the gifts that God has provided me in my life. And I also think that when it comes to hesitancy, um, a lot of the young folk, and that's who I really focus on, a lot of them are just procrastinating, right? They don't have a real solid reason as to why they're not getting the vaccine other than, well, I just haven't done it yet, and maybe I'll do it one day in the future. Well, one day in the future is today. And right now is the time that you need to invest in actually going to find it, get the vaccine. For the University of Minnesota, you have to be vaccinated to go to school at the U. You know, it's there's no longer really any other excuses that you could utilize that aren't, you know, a little bit hollow in that. And so it's time for us to actually just go ahead and get it. And I remember peer pressuring some some of my friends and some folk to get the vaccine and they were thankful afterward because it is just another layer of assurances. You know, it's just investing in yourself and investing in your future. You don't want to have a chronic illness for the rest of your life when it comes to how long COVID impacts even your mental capacity and your own your energy. You are not, you know, um, indestructible. And how you live in, at 50 might be determined about by right now. I'm a person who got COVID, who survived COVID. And I'm still, um, you know, addressing the impacts that COVID had on me. And I guess it was March. I'm still addressing those impacts. So it's something where you just need to know that even if you're not going to get your vaccine right now, stay prayed up, yes, but also stay masked up. Stay washing your hands. Okay, wash your hands, folks. I've seen people laxing on this one, the masks and washing your hands. Make sure you still abide by the don't go to, you know, public spaces if you have a little cough. I've been hearing a lot of people coughing, you know, around me in public spaces. Please stay six feet away from me. Um, but these are the things that you need to still abide by them because you know you're not vaccinated. Nobody else does, right? You know you're not vaccinated. It's time to get vaccinated and still abide by these CDC guidelines. Mm -hmm. You bring up such a great point about people coughing in public. And it's unfortunate because, you know, we've had allergy season. It's cold season. You know, you might have like missed, missed your uh, mouth a little bit and all of a sudden it went down the wrong <laughs> pipe. And now people think you got COVID because you can't stop coughing. It's really interesting how certain social norms have shifted because we're in this pandemic. And I know for me, if I catch you coughing by me, I'm like, hey, dog, <laughs> you got to go. You got to go. You got to get out of here. <laughs> Brett, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers to our community getting vaccinated right now? Uh, we don't think we're going to die. I mean, let's cut to the chase. We don't think we're going to die tomorrow. We don't think we're going to catch it. We don't think that, you know, anyone within our family is going to catch it. And sure enough, we've had over 700,000 individuals, and I think that's an undercount, to be perfectly honest, once we get the studies together, 
um, of what this is really about. I mean, it, the funny thing is I keep hearing people about the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccine. And it's like, you guys do know from age zero to age six, y'all are probably the most vaccinated individuals in the world, period. So what are you talking about? Now, some people don't want to hear the reality. Some people don't want it, you know, that because the way our society is working today is I know more than everyone else. I'm an expert. I looked it up on Facebook and on this and that. Somebody told me what was going on. And, and we're just not being real with ourselves. This is a pandemic of epic proportions. It's not the Black Plague. You know, I mean, that was a whole different beast. And we've been blessed because we have advanced. God's will, if that is the case, has been to give us knowledge to overcome these challenges. And even with that conversation, we still have people fighting back on this. You know, and, and, and again, when you really get down to it is people believing that they are bigger than what's going on. And, and we even do the whole thing of, you know, we send thoughts and prayers when we find out that someone has just passed from COVID, but we just keep stepping the next day. Our reality is, is that we absolutely believe we are bigger than what's going on. And that's going to kill us in the long run. You know, I am. Um... I, I agree with you. And I also think that some of our community members are facing other dangers that are so imminent that they just don't care or they don't have the capacity to focus on the impact of COVID. And it's unfortunate because COVID can still get you, even if, you know, you live in a high risk area or you're dealing with other uh, health implications or whatever your situation may be. Um, Adrian, I want to hear from you as our um, resident health equity expert. Uh, are the numbers getting better for our community? What, Where are we at as it relates to COVID? I feel like we're kind of plateauing in terms of our community going out and getting the vaccine, but are we contracting it at a lesser rate? How are we doing? Yeah. So, um, you know, overall in this state, the, we're kind of on a roller coaster. You know, we'll see highs and lows in terms of the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations and deaths. And the thing is, when we're at our highest, Black people are the greatest proportion of those who have disease are in the hospital, in the ICU, and dying. When we're at our lowest, Black people are the highest proportion of disease, hospitalization, ICU admission, and deaths. So no matter where the numbers are, our community is still being impacted more than any other community. The only other community that is, is impacted as us is the um, American Indian um, community. Their numbers, depending on where we are, tend to be higher than ours, but we are disproportionately carrying this pandemic on our backs. And it's unfortunate because we have the science to, to, to stop it. We know what to do to protect ourselves. And, you know, it, it always amazes me when people say, because I have a friend and she's a holistic healer. And um, she said, well, you know, we, we had COVID and we used our herbs and everything to get us through it. And I'm like, well, that's great. But there are entire cultures in other countries that this is their life. Their way of living is... Eastern medicine healing and herbs and, you know, holistic healing, and they are still getting COVID at high rates and dying at high rates. So clearly that is not the answer for everyone. And it's not going to work if we want to stop this pandemic. So, you know, I, I always tell people you have to have a healthy mix of Eastern and Western medicine. I am a believer that herbs are helpful. I've given them to my children before for things. I take them myself. I also take my medication that my primary physician has given me. So for instance, for my blood pressure, I have three different medications that I take for that, but I also take olive leaf extract because I know that helps with blood pressure. So you have to have a healthy mix of both. And I just don't know what it's gonna take to get through to our young people. What we're seeing is, the young adults, the 20 to age 30 to 40s, those are the, the largest number of people who are not getting vaccinated. 
And it's for a myriad of reasons. It is because they don't think it's going to impact them. It's because they think they're healthy. And as long as they eat healthy and they exercise and they take their herbs, they're going to be fine. I have two nieces who have not been vaccinated. They both have young children and they are waiting until their children can get vaccinated before they get vaccinated, which makes no sense to me because what happens to those kids if you get COVID now and get sick and die, well, they, you know, will get the vaccine eventually, but their mom won't be there to help them anymore. So, you know, I think we, we have to just keep sharing the information and the message with the community. You know, I never try to pressure people. Um, you know, I don't shame people because there's nothing shameful about being fearful or distrustful or questioning the science. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you deciding not to get vaccinated. I don't agree with it, but there's nothing wrong with it. That's your decision to make. But we have to think about others. And so there are people who can't come to my house. I've, I've told you this before. Um, there are people who can't come to my house because they're not vaccinated. And I will not have my son around them because they are not vaccinated. Um, so, you know, I think we have to move more to a community mind frame as opposed to an individual mind frame because that is what has um, kept us held behind thus far is we've approached it from an individual standpoint and not from a community standpoint what what is my part what do i have to do to keep my community safe and i think if we can go to a community mindset we'll have more success with um, getting people vaccinated. And, you know, again, what Ron said about access, definitely a problem. We first rolled the vaccines out. It was not rolled out equitably, you know? So um, that is definitely an issue that has been addressed. We're trying to do better with that. Um, I know in the state of Minnesota, we have done much better with the equitable distribution of the vaccine. And it has especially impacted how we roll out the vaccine for our five to 11 year olds. So they are gonna have multiple opportunities and places to get vaccinated so that they don't have the same issues. But we have to move to a community mind frame of what do we have to do to better support our community. And speaking of our five to 11 um, young people, who are now eligible to receive the vaccine. Um, I saw a memo that came out from uh, the Waltz administration saying that there are lots of incentives for our young people to go out and get the vaccine. Everything from tickets to the Minnesota Timberwolves games, to Vikings games, to um, concerts at First Avenue um, with artists who you know, catered more to a younger demographic. Um, and there's a whole list. So uh, that information is available on the state of Minnesota website. Um, of course, you can always go to the Minnesota Department of Health website if you want more information on the COVID-19 vaccine, where to get tested. Um, and of course, as those of us who are vaccinated and who are really taking this pandemic seriously, even at this stage in the game, um, never underestimate what a single post or word of mouth can do to influence somebody within um, your sphere of influence. I know for me, because of my work being in very public spaces and being around large crowds, even though I'm vaccinated, I get tested weekly just so I know I'm not transmitting anything to my daughter or um, immunocompromised members of my family. And I posted while I was getting tested last week on my social media and somebody DM'd me and was like, where is this? This is a place I've been going to for months, you know, but they had no idea. And I happen to know they live up the street. So never assume that people have the information, regardless of how many episodes of Black Life Amplified we do or whatever is out there. We can all do our part to share the information as it relates to COVID and keeping ourselves safe within uh, this pandemic. We can also share information about what's happening um, in our political sphere as well. So I'm going to go ahead and pivot our conversation to uh, the main portion of our conversation. Adrienne, I know you have to check out soon. So thank you for being here. Um, we'll ask you questions for as long as you're still here, of course. Uh, but I want to hear from all of you. What are your thoughts and feelings about yesterday's election? Adrienne, since I know we're running out of time with you, I'll have you go first. Okay. So we talked about this earlier. You know, um, it was disappointing. And um, I'm a firm believer that all of the passion and energy that goes into getting out the vote during a presidential election, we have to figure out how to mobilize our communities all the time, not just at presidential elections. 
What do we need to do to get that passion and energy behind every single election that occurs? Because people don't realize that every single election is important. No matter how big or small, it will determine our future. And so I just feel like we didn't have a good showing. Brett will talk about that more when he speaks, but we have to figure out how do we get the vote out in the black community all the time and not just at presidential elections? Great question. Brett, what are your thoughts? Um, thanks, Adrian, and thanks, um, Brett. Uh, you know, my thoughts are is that we continue to lag behind um, because we don't believe it's for us, even though these local elections have more impact in our lives, on our daily lives than anything else. I mean, this literally is where rubber hits road when it comes to public safety, when it comes to public health, when it comes to education and other pieces from there. These local elections are the ones that really shape our lives. And it's our, our, our lack of participation is, you know, is the statement. We don't believe in it. And we have to figure out how to change that because quite honestly, it affects us the most. Again, the issue of public safety was on the ballot yesterday. And one way or another, we still need a plan to be able to move on and start to figure out how we're going to do better public safety. But again, because of the lack of voice from our community, there is no agenda on that conversation. So again, let me, I'll, I'll say it this way. We need to do better to ensure that we actually can have a black agenda to be able to voice our opinion on those pieces. So the turnout was great in the grand scheme of things for the city of Minneapolis, 60 percent um, in certain uh, wards. It was 71 percent. But in communities that we live, where we're the majority of, uh, we lagged behind almost a three to one vote count between our communities and the broader communities. And that's something that has to be fixed yesterday. Very well said. Angela Rose, uh, what are your thoughts on yesterday's election and the results that have come in since? I definitely um, concur with Brett. And one of the things that I think about also is on the ballot in November is actually the last opportunity to vote right? To even get to the ballots that we see, there's a number of steps and a number of processes um, that we are also not involved in when it comes to, you know, depending on your party, getting the endorsement process together, the community education process on what the uh, charter amendment questions even were, what they meant going through it, the uh, just the whole process of even getting the signatures for the different um, amendments, or if it was by a commission. And to be a citizen led commission that doesn't even represent our city really well is something that is should be also a point of concern. So there have been a lot of little points that have been let down to our community even before November 2nd, yesterday's election. And it just goes to show how we need to be a part of the process in the beginning and not even at the end, even when, when you get to the November ballot of, oh, well, we weren't even um, talked to for what this meant. We should have been very early on and we should have been and we should constantly be involved in that beginning process and pushing things forward of civic engagement. But as Brett said, is that we need a black vote to have a black agenda. And when it comes to uh, what is the consensus around the black community, we still have a lot of work to do to gather that consensus and to gather that civic engagement knowledge and that um, public government knowledge to even get something through. So yeah, can really that consensus building, that identity, culture, community building, and putting it focused towards politics and putting it focused towards policy has to be our uh, real agenda in the moment. You know, that's very well said. I'm going to go to Ron in just a minute, but I want to ask you a follow-up question, Angela Rose. What do you think is it going to take in order for us to get that kind of collective um, identity for us to be able to form a true uh, agenda that serves our community, that our community feels comfortable to then go out and vote for? I think that's a really crucial question. And I also want to say, just as... Um, 
uh, Miss Adrian had talked about earlier about not shaming anyone for not uh, deciding to uh, take the vaccine. I don't shame people for not knowing about the process, right? Or even knowing so much about uh, the votes that are coming up or as knowledgeable about the candidates or things like that. But it is something where our community is coming from the point where even you had mentioned this earlier, Brittany, we have immediate issues that community members are facing, right? We have immediate and we just can't get myopic about those issues because they live in a broader scale of politics and policy that can be and should be addressed by our local government, state government and federal government. Um, but it really is that community education piece to making sure that people know. And then also, I really hope and I really do wish that some of these burdens that are placed on our community were lifted off. And I do believe if they were lifted off, we would have much more time to be like Ward 13, you know, and focused on, oh, well, you know, I live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. Nothing ever happens. Let me, the one thing I'm worried about is voting or in Ward 12. The one thing I'm worried about is whether they're going to turn Hiawatha golf course into, you know, uh, apartment buildings or not. Um, so, you know, if that's your one thing that you and your neighborhood is worried about, that's a privilege, right? That is a hardcore privilege. And there are parts of our city where they only have one thing to worry about, and that's a golf course. Whereas there's other parts of our city where uh, our communities live, where that is not the top worry. Voting is not the top worry. And we have to be realistic about that too. So that means we have to put more money, more time and more effort and more intentionality uh, on getting our communities uh, to the table. So very well said. We've got so much that we're holding on to as a people. And it's not just our historical trauma and the things that we've experienced, but every day continuing to face new challenges. And that's part of what made this election so critical is we've got a very real public safety at hand. We're at the epicenter of a global uprising. And this, this election um, has the ability or had the potential um, to really be historical, just given everything that we've experienced since the last election. Uh, what about you, Ron? What do you what are your thoughts on on the election and the results that have come out? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm always honored to be in company with the super brilliant people on this panel. Um, so again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, first, definitely want to shout out uh, organizers, activists, everybody who is working to get people out to vote on all sides of the issues in the campaigns. Um, that is noble work. And that's the work of building democracy. And I know a lot of folks are excited today and a lot of folks are dejected today, um, but everybody's exhausted today and just wanted to recognize and honor that. Um, the second thing is that we have to be really, really careful when we start talking about the black agenda or what the black community wants. One of the mistakes that a lot of campaigns actually made in this cycle was assuming that black folks were a monolith. And that's just not the case. There are very, very clear differences amongst black people in terms of class, in terms of ages and uh, th that demographic, in terms of where you live in the city, in terms of what kind of work that you do. And so we have to ask deeper questions about what we mean by that when we say community and what the agenda actually looks like. Uh, secondly, and I, and I tweeted this last night, ironically, 80% uh, of this country's adults, 80% are not on Twitter. That is a lot of people who are not online, expressing their opinions, getting their opinions from other people who are willing to express their opinions. And so when you design campaigns that are catered to that class of folks, um, you're missing out on a whole lot of other people who, for example, didn't know that there was even an election yesterday. I know so many politicos who've been involved for years that were calling me and texting me yesterday like, yo, completely forgot this was, there was an election. Who was on the ballot? How am I going to, you know, how are you voting? How should I vote? Right? Like, we can't make the assumption that everybody knows that November comes around, it's election time, you know? Um, we need, you know, Angela, Angela Rose, I'm so glad you said this earlier, um, to put a finer point on it, we actually have to bring people along on a process and a journey, especially when we're introducing things in their lives that are brand new, right? So we start talking about redoing public safety and uh, moving police to a different area or what have you, we gotta bring people along with those conversations, right? Um, when we talk talking about voting every single year and, signing amendments and primaries and caucuses and precincts and all those other things, you got to bring people along on that journey. Um, I don't, and I'm glad you all said this earlier, I don't blame our community, Black folks, for not voting 
um, at the rates as everybody else, because there are very, very clear reasons for that. Um, it's a very systemic thing. We've been blocked out of voting um, the majority of time where this country could vote. We were actually not allowed to vote. Um, when you don't have, um, when you put people in kind of a binary choice, right? Yes or no, this or that, um, folks don't really want to participate in those kinds of things. Um, I actually blame our campaigns and I blame our institutions more than our campaigns, ma mainly our institutions for not giving folks a reason um, to go out and vote, for not making very clear the connection between their participation and then our and the outcomes um, as a result of that. The areas where you see a lot of high voter turnout are areas where they've seen traditionally that when I show up, when I speak, when I call our council member, when I say something, it's largely reflected in the leadership or it's largely reflected in the outcomes <clears throat> as a result. Um, the, the, the second piece of this, the other part of this is, um, when people don't have a lot of optimism for their futures, um, when people aren't as engaged with these institutions that way, they're less likely to be attracted to the traditional left, right ping pong of, uh, left, right politics, right? So we have to ask deeper questions and involve a lot more people in uh, how we approach this. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, the, I love the fact that we had such a high voter turnout across the city. It shows that people are interested and engaged and we have to figure out how we stretch that to all communities. And for the folks who, you know, are not super happy about how the public safety amendment went, consider this, 44% of people in the city who voted, voted uh, for a different vision for public safety. That is a lot of people, even if the ballot itself weren't uh, passed, that's still a lot of people who are ready to reimagine what policing could look like in our city. That's a good starting place for folks looking to change these things. Um, and it was a binary choice. I'd argue that if there are more options, right, in terms of what the outcome would be, it's status quo or brand new department with a whole bunch of new things that we're not certain about yet. I think that if there were decisions in between that, you see a lot more people who are supportive of um, completely reimagining what it looks like to keep people safe in the city. But when faced with a binary choice, um, you saw how people voted that way. A, a really interesting point, Ron, about uh, the way in which people are processing uh, this information and the issue of public safety, I'd, I'd argue, was probably uh, the biggest issue um, for people to consider when, when casting their vote. Now, it was voted um, that the Minneapolis Police Department will not be defunded or restructured in any type of, type of way. And so for all intents and purposes, the status quo will be maintained. Um, I want to ask all of you, what's next now? Um, because a lot of people, you know, since George Floyd, but even before Jamar Clark, uh, Philando Castile, there have been arguments that as we've seen uh, the growth and expansion of the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been um, very polarizing with the Black community and the police, uh, some would say uh, that our communities have been under patrolled, um, under supported, uh, that the police um, departments have been understaffed and therefore they can't respond to everything. Um, and it's really created a lot of issues in terms of people feeling as if um, those who are currently in power to protect and serve and are using our tax dollars to protect and serve aren't doing so almost in a form of retaliation. Um, I'm curious as if you all buy into uh, that concept of, of police responding negatively to um, us saying enough is enough and what that means now that this vote has taken place. So Brett, I'll start with you. Well, um, the simple reality of it is, is that we don't have as many officers to be able to patrol our areas. The numbers are what they are. At one point during the summer, I know uh, hearing this directly from leadership, that at one point in North Minneapolis, there was only four officers traveling, uh, patrolling North Minneapolis, a community of close to seven thousand four. 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 So, I mean, that's the reality, you know, based on your staffing, based on the ability to uh, have people, you know, stay within your labor laws and everything else. I mean, the reality is, is that we are not patrolling our streets. 
And the simple fact is, is that we have a lot of people out here who are doing, you know, the various things that are probably not in our best interest, who know that and are taking advantage of it. Every Sunday, there is a drag race somewhere in North Minneapolis. Every, the carjackings that took place. Again, let's, 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 but even let's take a step back. We've had 54 children shot this year in Minneapolis alone. 54 shot children. So we can, you know, what's next is God knows. It takes leadership. This could have been done. These conversations could and should have been done if this was an uh, urgency of the council and the mayor after George Floyd was murdered. That didn't happen. We keep crying out that things aren't happening. We keep screaming that this, and, and let's be, let's keep it real. It's also on us because we haven't set the, set the thing of saying, this is what we demand as well. This, we don't have that luxury anymore because we are losing lives. We are literally losing lives. And at, the, uh, at our hands, for the most part. So as much I would love to be able to think that we, we can point the finger at somebody else, it's all of us. Minneapolis is, bl is, is, is blessed. It could be worse. Let's just, we can say it that way. It could be worse. But when I look at my friend K.G. Wilson, who lost his grandchild, when I hear about all the young people who are afraid to go to a park, I mean, it's not just so much about the people who get shot. It's about the people who feel like their lives have to be deterred. And so, you know, as much as I like to say that I don't want to, you know, hold people to account for not participating in processes, but you choose by not choosing. You definitely affirm that it's okay. One way or another. So the question for us is how do we elevate from there? How, you know, it, the one thing that I know we talked about, but even the whole conversation around getting the shot itself, that we have to give somebody a $50 ticket or something of that nature to keep people alive. Well, that's how we think about it at this point in time, that my life is worth 50 bucks, but it wasn't worth anything prior to that. So, yeah, we can talk about the historic trauma. We can talk about the systemic and all that kind of stuff. We know it because we have studied it. Question is, what are we going to do about it? So, you know, again, the turnout is what it was. I'm disappointed, you know, from the standpoint of is that our voices will not be heard. Again, in, this, in the park board alone, we could literally have an all-white park board. I mean, I want you to understand that simple thing for a community that is almost half people of color. That, that literally we will have an all white park board. That is a possibility. And we can talk about the processes and everything else. We can talk about how, you know, people try to keep us out. But we know every first Tuesday in November, we have an election. It's like clockwork. So the when people start talking about issues of because I had running debates about voter suppression even um, about how our voices are being suppressed and and muted and it's like if I go to the poll I actually overcome it but yes people are trying to do it why because they are able to control our lives and we have to remind this remind ourselves that 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 this is what it's about this is a culture war this is a real this is real. And I think we take ourselves for granted too often. We get caught up into left, right, progressive, and moderate, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the at the end of the day, don't we want to be better? And quite honestly, we do not have a vision for better right now. So if I don't see better, if I don't see hope, if I don't see how I can actually be a part of it, I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, lean back. And that's what we have to overcome. We have to get over the transactional. We have to get over the fear. We have to get back to the belief that we can build our own communities right now because this will continue to happen. The park board is a $120 million enterprise. The city of Minneapolis is a $1.4, $1.5 billion enterprise and that we're not a part of the decisions. We got to do better.
we got to do better for ourselves. And quite honestly, if anything, let's try to find a way next year not to have 54 children get shot. Let's start there. That would be a phenomenal place to start. It's it's just unacceptable, the amount of violence that we're seeing in our community. And I think it's indicative of um, several things from public safety issues to um, just trauma within our communities. I don't think um, we talk enough about what it what are the um, public health implications from a behavioral health standpoint on being at the epicenter of a global uprising of George Floyd being our neighbor and our brother, somebody who we either knew personally or had mutual friends with. The fact that we are constantly walking and driving past the place where he was murdered and gathering there that that's very real trauma that's impacting our people and um, it's very real. I think it also impacts the way in which we handle one another um, when we may be having opposing viewpoints politically. I'm also curious from your perspective and, and anyone can jump in, um, I feel like this issue of defunding the police or abolishing the police um, or you know, the the conversation around public safety was very divisive within our communities. Um, now the vote has taken place, uh, the decision has been made, but what does that mean for the relationships uh, that may have been fractured during this GOTV period? That That is a great question, Britt, and I, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I don't know, it's gonna take a lot to heal those wounds. I saw some dear friends going at each other. Um, I saw people who, quite honestly, did not understand what was at stake still speak with authority and absolutely cause confusion. I saw many people who were just confused and did not want to get involved or people who just didn't believe that was going to make a difference. And to get through all that is just remarkable. The conversations that I know I had with people across the city and even outside the city um, were, were to the point where um, you almost had the question, what, what was next? And, and because of lack of leadership, all sides, um, all sides of this conversation, that you have to question what is next. The thing is, is that today is November 3rd. Nothing happened one way or another. But something needs to happen. So who's going to take that weight? Who's going to actually say, okay, we're going to sit down and start to deal with this? Because again, here's the fun part to this. In two years, just to give everybody a heads up, we come right back around and do another election for city council. So this is not settled at all. But the question is going to be, what does it mean to be safe in our communities? And especially for a community like North Minneapolis in Ward 4 and Ward 5, that was under 50%. What do you want? Because that's the other side to this conversation is, what do you want? I'm a North Sider tr through and through. Family's been here since 1920, 1919. So when I hear other people coming in and saying, this is what North Side is, well, I was like, you ain't even from here. I need you to stop. Go somewhere else. Let's start there. But then the other conversation is, well, what do we want? And how are we going to go about it? And with love and with some, some belief that we actually can be better after all this. So I'm concerned. I, I Again, the keys of the castle right now are in Jacob Fry's hands. He has executive authority, even though he had great authority last time around. We gave him four more years after an international incident. Our call to the mayor should be simple. What you gonna do, Jacob? How are you gonna make this thing happen? And to the new council members, what y'all gonna do? Y'all. Y'all rose your hands and run for two years. What you going to do? And how are we going to do it as a community? With love and with understanding that we have to protect ourselves. Because here's the thing. Our kids are wilding out. I know this for a fact. Working, you know, and, and working and trying to build out things to make things a little bit better. And these kids are looking at us saying, well, y'all, I can't get y'all stuff together. So why am I going to worry about it? So the reality is, is that we are all on notice right now. We are all on notice. Who's going to start the conversation and say, we absolutely deserve X, Y, Z, and this is how we're gonna get there. And we're gonna get there together. Um, 
I'm not going to hold my breath to say exactly how that plays out. I hear the, the, the intensity from vote yes still. Like it's almost like it's a, we have to do it this way. No, you don't have to do it that way. Because quite honestly, you didn't even have a chance to talk about this across the board. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, Britt, this is, this is one of the great things about this form right here. We have to do a lot more to really start to gain people's energy and understanding that we might, we, we almost have to call that all call type of a thing where the village has to come around somehow and start to say, this is the unacceptable pieces, hold people to account, making sure that people are participating and then making sure that we have the necessary systems for people to be a part of it, however they are. Just as Ron said, 80% people, people ain't on Twitter. That's real business, but we all have a phone call. We all have a phone book. So the simple fact is, is that we're all interconnected. The question is, is do we want to connect and to build something? This is that test for Minneapolis. I'm quite honestly, I don't think we were ready to pivot into the Department of Public Safety, but we are definitely not, we are definitely not prepared to maintain with what's going on right now. And we gotta change this up quick. Very well said. Um, I think it's incredibly important for us to remember and just be mindful of because we'll be doing this again. You know, the elections, um, they continue to to come around. And when the ballots are cast and they're counted, um, regardless of what the outcome is, our community is still there. You know, we still have to be in relation with our community members and um, it doesn't serve us to advocate for the good of our community and then destruct it by damaging the relationships that we have inside. You know, and of course it's, it's easier said than done. And as I mentioned, um, I think I've seen personally shifts in our community and in um, behavior of, of, of certain leaders and, and individuals in community, quite frankly, because people are tired. People are traumatized. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're at the epicenter of a global uprising. There's a spike in community violence, as well as all of the things that we deal with in our personal lives. It's a lot. It, it really is a lot. And it, it really does make me wonder uh, what's next and how do we how do we mend um, the tears in, in our community so that we can uh, enter into that spirit of collectivism, um, having, having a unified agenda where we can, um, not settling for the monolith trope either, but also recognizing that there are some things that could benefit us as a people if we could simply come together and be on one accord uh, to move things forward. Um, so I'm, I'm curious for, for you all, um, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Um, I'll take a crack at that. You know, um, there are a couple of ways you could think about this, right? There's the one way you can say, where do we go from here as it relates to public safety, right? Mm -hmm. Starting with, you know, the folks who voted to uh, institute the Department of Public Safety. Again, 44% of the city, that's a lot of people, right? Can you, can you find ways to build on top of that? We have to get out of this mindset that election day is the finish line. Election day is the starting line, not the finish line, right? Like we're not done on election day. We get started on election day and we got to stop sprinting from election day to election day and think we're going to get all this stuff done in one electoral cycle. No, election day is alongside the journey. You run straight through that line and keep on going to the next one, right? So everything that people did up until yesterday, no matter what side of the debate or what candidate or what amendment or what have you, that doesn't go away. That's still find ways to connect all of that through the next cycle, through the next year, because guess what? We've just beat each other up in Minneapolis for the last year and a half, but coming right around the corner is a midterm where people who, they're not having debates about public safety. They're having debates about your humanity and about your rights to exist in this country and about your rights to vote and about your ability to make choices over your own body, about over your ability to participate in this in the economic society. Like that's what's around the corner. And so it behooves us to figure out how do we make sure that we, find ways to mend those fissures, knowing that the real enemy, right, the real opposition, the, 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 the thing that does not want us to exist on this planet or in this country is right around the corner. We're one or two election cycles away from literally not being able to vote. I mean, this is not hyperbolic to suggest that uh, what we went through this past year and a half locally 
pales into comparison over what we're going to have to come together and solve uh, around the country and frankly around the globe when we start considering the climate emergency that we're finding ourselves in. So locally, though, I think that it would be wise for the folks who emerged victorious in their uh, elected positions yesterday, and we're going to get more information later today, to come right out with a vision for uh, public safety, right? Because I guarantee you the people that Actually, I know this. I talked to people all day today. There were a lot of people who voted no on that question that they weren't voting to affirm the status quo. They're voting because they had concerns about what the alternative was and they wanted to buy themselves a little more time or ask more questions or get more clarity or what have you. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that there was this many people who decided, no, we want things to stay the exact same. It just meant given the two choices that I have, I'm less concerned with this one and I'm more concerned with that one. Let's dig deeper and figure out why people did that so that we can bring them along on a journey, right? We can't say, okay, we're gonna do this brand new stuff and not take the time and do the work of bringing folks along, getting yeah. their input, you know, making sure they're educated and feeling good and comfortable about that. So I think that that's actually where we go next is how do we figure out, because everyone across the city is trying to figure this question out. We just wanna be safe, all right? I wanna be safe, I don't want my kids shot, I wanna feel comfortable walking from my car, from the grocery store, awesome, let's start there and then all the concerns that people had about this amendment, how do we address them piece mm. by piece and ensure that uh, a lot of folks are involved in that vision? Because, you know, to everyone's point, we're not done yet. Election day is, again, the starting line. So let's start and get the work done. Very well said. Um, we are wrapping up, but I do want to go to uh, Brett. I know you had you wanted to respond um, to what Ron was saying as well. I was just saying amen to that because I was one of those no votes that said table the discussion. Let's figure it out because on November 3rd, we should start the conversation. So that's it. I think that's a good number of those individuals that we should be you know, reaching out to very soon. Absolutely. Um, I want to pivot to Angela. Um, I'm curious your thoughts. You mentioned, you know, particularly as it related to public safety, it was either vote no or vote yes. Um, but in other parts of the ballot, there was ranked choice voting. Um, do you think that the ranked choice voting was helpful in this election cycle? Um, or was it was it confusing to people? What What's your perspective on, on how that influenced the results of the election? So you give me the hard question, right? Um, but, you know, I definitely do think that ranked choice voting for this year has been utilized differently. Um, the campaigns around uh, understanding ranked choice voting has been utilized differently than ever before. You know, this is the first time I've ever seen a, uh, a, a Ilhan Omar levels, you know, po political uh, celebrity endorse two people for the same uh, position and say, well, if you don't like one, then you still can vote vote for the other one. Um, and so, or just the don't rank fry initiative, right? This is the first time I've ever seen that. And that was very interesting, but it was very much um, like Ron had said, focused on a particular community instead of actually on our community, educating our community, what rank choice voting does looks like and how it can be utilized for or against our community. It is just a, a, a framework. It is just, you know, we decided we wanted ranked choice voting, so we have it. If an overwhelming majority of Minneapolis voters in the next two years decided they did not want ranked choice voting, we could go back and undo ranked choice voting, right? So it's not the ranked choice voting per se. It is how changing how we're voting has been um, not uh, equitable in getting the information out there on how it works and how, you know, we even strategize around putting forth um, candidates. We've got a whole list of characters that were on the mayor or a ballot and some of these um, uh, city council ballots. We had a whole list of characters and what we needed truly was leaders um, and not just nice guys. We need leaders right now. We need leaders for a crisis and a leaders for our future because we are currently in a crisis. But people don't seem to forget. They seem to forget that just because you're a nice guy doesn't mean you're the right guy for the for the uh, position right now. And there's a lot of people who are running on clout and they say, well, it's ranked choice, so it's OK, um, because it's not the same as splitting the vote. 
right? No, you can still split the vote on some rank choice things. You can still kind of like politically maneuver on, you know, putting some candidates together. It's still the politics. You can still have politics. Rank choice voting didn't solve politics. You, you see it. So it's one of those things where we need to get back to actually choosing candidates who are leaders for the position and who are knowledgeable about the position. Because something we're also seeing is I'm an activist. Okay, so I'm saying this with love to the activist community. We got some activists who run who are not ready for the positions that they are running for. And when they get into those positions, they spend a good amount of time trying to figure out what and how government works with their position, what powers and what they can and cannot do. So, you know, and I'm an activist, you know, too, and I say this lovingly, and it is fine to take that time too to learn to do, you know, how to maneuver correctly. But right now is a crisis. And right now, we should have been training up people for politics instead of politics. And unfortunately, there's a lot of politics going on. So it's not really as much about ranked choice voting, but how, you know, ranked choice voting has been kind of maneuvered by the white liberal left in some type of ways. And it didn't always work. And we see that right now. It hasn't really worked out for them as they thought it would, but it's okay. You know, we can move forward and it's just for our community to know there is a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes that are politics and not even politics and not even policy. So let's just get that started. Very well said. Um, we've only got a, a few minutes left of this show, um, but I'm curious, you all have been on this show before. You do amazing work within the community. Um, you know the landscape of the community very well. Um, you're from the community and you're in the community. Uh, are any of you going to be on a ballot in the future? Can we can we count on possibly ranking ranking your names moving forward? Brett, what, That's a what? no for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even running for another position in the NAACP and I can say this. It's a no for me. I love this community, but for me and my goals, my goals are aligned with the future of our community. That does not have to mean my face on a ballot, my name on the ballot. So for me, I'm trying to go be a professor. I'm trying to be a community scholar activist. And so that's number one question I also get asked. And so that's the number one, no. <laughs> I know well, people say never say never, but I'm saying never because that, how they drag people's names, you know, I'm going to know. Angela Rose is done. Brett, what do you say? Um, amen. And uh, hey, I, I got the hat and the t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. Been there, done that. We'll never do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, th this was even almost one of my last uh, political conversations that I'm going to be having. You know, I'm going to be stepping aside, you know, because we got some other things that have to get done. We got to get this North Commons project done and move some things on from there. So um, the reality is, is that um, I, we just ain't got time. Just ain't got time for that, for that, you know, if this wasn't a uh, a rated PG show, I, I'd say something else. So, you know, you know, you know where, you know where my head's at and, it takes a lot to do it. Um, we commend those and we have to teach and we have to prepare, we have to start recruiting better and start putting better. Just as Angela Rose was saying, we got to find some better people because this ain't working right now. Um, and, um, you know, we, we let's let's quit trying to get our friends into a position that they ain't ready for. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. So. All right. Well, Ron. It's on you. What do you what do you think? Can we can we count on you to to possibly check check your name in a in a ballot one day? You know, I'm I'm a firm believer that uh people should spend more time figuring out what their highest and best contribution is in the moment for the fight, as opposed to building up their lives to one day be in office or building up their lives to one day have a leadership role. And so the route that I've taken is like where I think my where I can make the highest contributions uh in order for people to live their best lives in order for people to experience during their lives, that's what I want to spend time doing. Um, so far, it hasn't been in an elected office, and um, but I think it's a good thing, right? We need to show folks that we can be leaders and we can make change without being in elected office. And that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to take that leadership into public office so that people can see themselves, so that people can um, bring people together, right? Be a bridge between communities, elevate lived experiences that 
aren't currently in the discourse. There are no working class people in Congress, zero. Yet they're making all these laws about working class people. That's an example of, you know, we need to recruit better and we need to show people that no matter what your lived experience is, if it's not present in the debate, it certainly deserves to be part of the conversation. We need to make sure we elevate that. So uh, whatever role that looks like for me, that's what I'm down with doing. And um, I'm just, you know, really excited to be in a community where people actually care about these outcomes and are putting themselves on the line to uh, demonstrate that my life matters and putting themselves on the line to make sure that we have good representation. And uh, we're not done yet. So um, let's just build on that and uh, take it forward. In short, I'm going to be very excited to vote for uh, Ron. And, you know, I, I definitely believe in uh, Ron and his vision. So <laughs> very excited for him, for his campaign. <laughs> You know, Ron had a very, a very smooth, you know, non-controversial answer. And here goes Angela Rose blowing up the spot. <laughs> I, I, I love that. But no, I had to, I had to end with that question because you all are so knowledgeable about what's happening within your communities, um, assessing the political landscape and working within your sphere of influence to make sure that those around you um, are empowered and educated as a result to uh, politics and how they influence the communities and the world that we live in. Uh, what I hope that our panelists uh, glean from this conversation and from you all and how you show up in community is that regardless of what aisle of the conversation uh, that you may fall on or your differences of opinion, it's it's up to us to do the work. Politics don't work if we don't, if we don't educate ourselves and be willing to show up and to have the conversations and to do the work. Angela has been serving, you know, and she's ready to take a break and that's okay. Uh, but there has to be someone else who's going to come behind Angela to do this work, right? And so it's the responsibility of all of us, not just on election day, but each and every day. I hope that we can continue to build on the momentum that we had up until this point. Um, and I am, regardless of the things that we have experienced in in the past, um, I am completely optimistic. I'm actually a new resident of the city of Minneapolis. Y'all are hearing it here first. Uh, moved over the weekend. Um, I am looking forward to all uh, that our community has to offer. And I believe that the answers are not just in the people whose names uh, were voted on last night, but it's in the names of people who are watching this town hall and who have been participating in the various community programs that we have. Um, I really do believe that we are our, big our biggest and best solution to the issues that we're facing in community. So we do have to wrap up. We're over time. Panelists, thank you so much for your time. Producers um, and sponsors, thank you. This has been Black Life Amplified. It's the virtual town hall series hosted by the African American Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany L. Wright with Insight News. This is actually going to be our last show of the year. We're going to wrap up and do, do some new things, but I thank you guys so much for watching and taking time to voice your opinions, to share this with your networks, and I hope that you continue to find ways to engage with us in the future. Until next time, be good to yourself, be good to others, and uh, we'll see you soon. Peace. <laughs>